All right, good evening everyone and welcome to our St. Paul City Council candidate forum for Ward 6. Uh, we'll start this forum, uh, or actually before the forum starts, Mayi from Fair Vote Minnesota is going to speak for a couple of minutes on ranked choice voting. Good evening, everyone. Um, again, my name is Mayi Chang, and I'm a community organizer with Fair Vote Minnesota. Fair Vote Minnesota is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and we advocate and do education on ranked choice voting. So, um, raise your hand if you are familiar with ranked choice voting. Awesome, that means I don't have to do an education up here, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so this year's election, we have both the school board and city council races. You won't be able to rank school board candidates, but you will um, be able to rank candidate, candidates running um, for city council in your ward. So many of you probably have one favorite candidate who you want to vote for already. I still encourage you to listen to today's forum and see how you want to rank these candidates as your first, second, and third choice. Your second and third choice never harms your first, <clears throat> and ranking the same candidate multiple times will not help your first choice. So how do votes get counted? Candidates win the election by getting a majority of first choice votes, which is 50% plus an additional vote. If your first choice has the fewest votes, your first choice candidate will be eliminated and your vote will transfer or be reallocated to your second choice. The counting and reallocation continues in rounds until one candidate receives a majority of votes. If only two candidates remain and neither has received a majority of votes, then the candidate with the most votes is the winner. So again, if you are voting by mail, voting early, or on election day, which is on November 5th, remember to rank your ballot as it will maximize your voice and your power. Um, if you have any more questions about how ranked choice voting works, you can come talk to me. We also have brochures and flyers at the back table. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayi. My name's Mary Rice, and I'm a league trained moderator and member. Tonight's forum is sponsored by the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, St. Paul Neighborhood Network, District 2 Community Council, and Payne Phelan, District 5 Planning Council. We believe the success of St. Paul depends on the values, knowledge, and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it's essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of people running for elected office in St. Paul. It is this understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions. We appreciate candidates and audience members taking the time to be here tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to let you know that you all have cards on your chairs, um, and those are there for writing questions to the candidates. Once you have a question, please hold it up, wave it, and a volunteer will come and pick it up from you. If you'd like to register to vote after the forum, stop by the league's table, and they will help you do that. Tonight's form is for the candidates running for Ward 6, Alex Bourne, Kasim Basuri, Greg Copeland, Danielle Swift, Terry Tao, and Nelsie Yang. The candidates participating in tonight's form have all agreed to the forum rules, which were included in their invitation to participate. So each candidate will give a two-minute introductory statement. The candidates will then have one minute to answer questions. Um, they will also have 30 seconds for rebuttal, but that's only if necessary and only if that candidate gets called out by name. A timer will signal when they have 15 seconds remaining. 30? Okay, when there are 30 seconds remaining, is there a 15 second? Okay, when they have 30, sex re 30 seconds remaining and when their time is up. Uh, we'll accept uh, written questions throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must not be personal in nature and must be on topics relevant for the position. All questions must be addressed to all candidates. Once you have a question written, please pass it or hold it up and an usher will collect it. Questions that are of a personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Similar questions may be cons consolidated and questions may be edited for clarity or brevity. 
Campaign literature, buttons, signs, clothing, or any other campaign-related items are not allowed in the room. Um, but information on candidates is available on the tables outside the forum. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause or any other noise whatsoever until the forum has ended so that the candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions and for purposes of um, uh, uh, good videotaping. Uh, please also now place your cell phones on silent if they aren't already. Members of the media may be recording this form for their own use and the form is being video recorded by the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. With that, we'll start with opening statements. Candidates, you each have two minutes for an opening statement. We will begin with Alexander Bourne. Good afternoon uh, and thank you all uh, for organizing this. Um, I put together a little prepared, excuse me, a prepared statement for you all. Um, excuse me, uh, in efforts of giving uh, voters a better insight into who I am and what I have been doing uh, the last 10 years. I put together a little something uh, for you all uh, based on two questions that I was recently asked. Uh, what qualifies me to lead a co-governing effort in the city of St. Paul, uh, on the city council, and um, uh, what have I done uh, for the east side, the city of St. Paul, as well as the state of Minnesota. My response is as follows. I am a socially minded and civically engaged individual. I'm a community member that loves St. Paul. I was raised and educated in St. Paul, K through 11. I want to be the person that brings people together to not only build organic community, but to help create policies that reflect who we are as a community and abolish those that do not. I truly believe that if I can get common folk engaged in the political process, then we will have common sense policies and less government uh, in our everyday lives. I stem from a family that believes education, hard work, and a well vocation go hand in hand. I have dedicated my life to community advocacy and campaign development for political candidates seeking to be socially economically and culturally inclusive. Though socially innovative, I have cultivated spaces for learning and the advancement of campaigns through collaborations, risk mitigation, and resource mobilization. I have an educational background in English literature, chemistry, and biology from Xavier University of Louisiana, and I look forward to answering any questions that you all may have. Thank you. Thank you. Kasim Busuri. Thank you. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this forum together and for the, for the community members who came tonight, this evening, to, to listen to us. Um, I'm here to listen to everyone and hear your questions about what I can do to make the East Side a better place for all of us. Um, I come from uh, Somalia. My family um, left Somalia after the Civil War and went to uh, Kenya and lived in a refugee camp. My mother, who is uh, someone that I look up to and who is a role model for me, was the first woman to be given a job in the food distribution through the Red Cross. Um, she was a, ch a change engine for, for that refugee camp there. So she was put in a position where it was a male-dominated position, and she was able to do her job well. And I follow her footstep today, and she's still alive. My father is still alive. My family of 10... Ten brothers and four sisters are still here with us in Minnesota. Um, and myself, I have uh, uh, th uh, three children now. I just had a baby daughter on Thursday. Um, and <clears throat> I, I moved to the east side uh, three years ago because I wanted to, to do something good for the east side. Um, I worked while I was going to college at the U of M um, as a medical transport. And I would take chemically dependent clients from the east side to the west metro to get treatment. And I said to myself when I was driving through the east side of St. Paul, um, why has St. Paul forgotten about the east side? And I said to myself that, that that first time I came through the east side that one day I'll move back here, I'll buy a house, and I'll do something about, um, uh, about fixing and helping the east side become a better place. Thank you. Thank you. 
Greg Copeland. Good evening, folks, and, and thank you for coming this evening and, and sharing your time uh, with the community. I, I think, uh, you know, St. Paul as a city and Ward 6 in particular uh, are, are really in difficult uh, straits. We, we have a situation now where uh, the east side has become sort of a poverty uh, collection center. Uh, our area has not gotten the benefit of uh, the public funds that are out there that we need to solve the problems of housing uh, and roads and schools and all the other health-related uh, things that we need. And frankly, uh, it's very disappointing to hear uh, our mayor talk about uh, reducing the size of the police department given uh, the crime situation. I live right off of Payne Avenue and Grid 54, one of the most active crime areas in St. Paul. And, uh, you know, whenever I go to the crime uh, meetings down at the uh, uh, E-Team, uh, everybody knows about Grid 54, uh, sitting right there, uh, you know, south of the uh, dollar store. I live right, uh, right there. And, and we don't have an option but to take on uh, those problems uh, with regard to crime. The other thing we don't have an option about is dealing with the poverty in this community. Uh, I, I've been to these forums with my friends here, and uh, we have lots of stories about, uh, you know, we're going to do this about climate change, or we're going to do this about this and that. You know, folks, we got to deal with what we've got. We've got 50% of the people in, uh, who rent are not uh, able to really uh, afford the places they're in. They're, they're paying over 30% of their rental. Uh, you know, they're, they're burdened. Uh, the homeowners in, in our city as a whole, 36% are in that same position. We've got a crisis. And if we go spending all the uh, funds of the city on the things that don't matter, we're not going to get there. I want to double the spending in our CIB funds on our road repair. We've, we've got... Uh, $36 million uh, that we can put to work right now on that job. Thank you. Danielle Swift. Good evening. How y'all doing? Uh, my name is Danielle Swift, and I'm running for City Council Ward 6. Um, I'm an organizer, so I work at the Frogtown Neighborhood Association, and I'm very much so boots on the ground. Um, I'm running for City Council because I feel like we need to change our approach on how we're dealing with issues. You know, it's, it's good to hear um, poverty coming up as an issue, um, but it's disheartening not to hear how it correlates to the violence and how poverty is the root issue of violence. And so I'm here to be that reminder. I'm here to come with empathy and compassion, thinking about our community members and their quality of life. Um, even the people who are involved in some of these things, they are our neighbors, they are our community. <laughs> And when we all do better, we all do better. I know that the DFL loves Paul Wellstone, um, and I really do believe that. So I'm here to bring an organizing spirit to the city council. Um, I'm here to go and reach those people who are not actively engaged. I'm here to change the process of engagement um, and really change the way that we are doing things instead of in, in always expecting people to come to us to change the method and go to the people. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I appreciate your time. I know it's valuable, um, and I look forward to the rest of this evening. Thanks. Terry Tao. All right. Thank you again for having us here tonight. My name is Terry Tao. I'm a mother of two. I'm a wife, a daughter of Hmong refugees, and an oldest child. I grew up in St. Paul in the Frogtown neighborhood, and I've lived on the east side for 12 years with my family. I know what it's like to grow up in a neighborhood where you feel like no one uh, pays attention to you because you're poor, and also where you can't go outside because of the crime that's happening there. But however, I was taught at a young age that I personally have to be involved in making this change happen. And so for the past 15 years, I've worked on issues of community economic development, worked on the foreclosure crisis that hit the east side here extremely hard, helping Hmong families call their banks so that they could renegotiate their loan payments. I've sat on the board of the East Side Neighborhood Development Company, where we worked for many years to make Payne and Arcade the avenues they are today, the business districts. And I know we, that's still a work in progress. I've also sat on a number of different boards and commissions, most particularly the Planning Commission at the City of St. Paul for the past nine years, where I worked on increasing bike paths and trails here on the East Side, and particularly sidewalks, because a lot of folks are pedestrians and we're also isolated from a lot of transit. I also grew up in a small business family, so I care a lot about how we increase the tax base here in St. Paul, and especially here on the east side. And despite 
the things that are happening here, despite the crime, people still see the neighborhood as full of opportunity. And that's a big reason why I'm running, because I want to build on these opportunities. It's not just in the places, but in the people who live here. We had a lot of young people here in the neighborhood. They are the next workforce that we will need here in the city of St. Paul. So I believe we need to invest in the people here and in place to make uh, my family and make many generations here better off in the years to come. Thank you. Nelsie Yang. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nelsie Yang, and um, I just really want to take some time to really thank all the leaders um, and community and neighbors who are here because this is what it actually looks like for us to really rebuild our community. Um, and I want to share that for me, like I'm running for a city council really to bring progressive leadership to our entire community here and at City Hall. Um, when, I, when I look at the community here in the east side, it really reminds me a lot about what it looked like growing up, you know, as like um, as somebody who lived in poverty. Um, and, you know, for me, like I am a Hmong daughter of refugees. I'm somebody who is a renter here in the east side. I'm, I am a union steward and organizer over at Take Action Minnesota. And um, one of the reasons why I started doing, doing political work, you know, especially at a very, very young age many years ago, is because I am somebody who is determined to really bring our communities together across race, class, gender, and age. And, like, you know, when I think about that mission, that purpose, um, that's something that, you know, the east side really reflects. Like, our community here is so diverse, so beautiful. Um, and, and what hurts the most is actually just really realizing that we live in systems that have always been built to leave out people of color, been built to leave out renters, built to leave out, you know, even, like, our public schools. Um, and uh, immigrants, refugees. And um, to me, this is actually the strength of the East Side. And our families here are so hardworking. What we really need in city council is somebody who is who is here willing to organize, willing to fight for a fair share. Um, and when we, when we actually get, our, get that, when we achieve that type of engagement as well in our community locally, I really believe that that's how we can make sure we can push for rental rights together. That's how we can make sure that we get our community prepped and ready to face all the climate injustices and crises that are going to come up ahead. Um, and also so like uh, be on the pathway to fully funding our schools and make sure that everyone has a roof over their head and that our seniors families are not being priced out of the east side here and that we also have an advocate fighting for our small businesses and so you know I'm thankful for everyone here in the room I see so many people who were here supporting me at the DFL convention in May and, and at that time we led in first place in all the ballots and I'm so excited to share more about the campaign in a bit here. All right thank you now we're ready to start the question and answer portion of our forum. Um, the candidates will be asked questions and asked to answer in varying order. So with the first question, uh, we will start, uh, the first uh, uh, candidate to be asked will be Danielle Swift, then Nelsie Yang, then Terry Tao, and then the other three will follow. And the question is, do you have any plan to improve the lives or enhance the safety of seniors in the community? And if so, what is that plan? Absolutely. Um, I, I think I spend a lot of my time focusing on housing. It's an area that I work in day to day. Um, and I do think of issues in a matter of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where if we are addressing um, basic needs, that we will see an, an improvement from there. And I know that seniors are one of the fastest displaced communities when it comes to rise, raising rents and raising property taxes. Um, so just with fair housing, when we say for all, and we're talking diversity, it's not just race, but it's age as well. Um, and so working to keep rents affordable, um, especially if someone's living on a fixed income, which I know is the case for a lot of our seniors in Ward 6. Nelsie Yang. Can you repeat the question again? Have any plan to improve the lives or enhance the safety of seniors in the community? And if so, what is it? Yes, this is something that's so important to me you know, as like as a young person, as someone who grew up as a daughter of refugees. Um, something that I've had to do like uh, since like my upbringing was really like bridging the gap between um, you know young people and elders. Like when I was like a little girl, five six years old, I was already helping like translate for my elders in my community, the Hmong community, and even outside of that as well. And to me, like making sure that our seniors, our elders, um, are, are able to live a good life and a life that is dignified, that they're proud of, is so deeply important to me because it's also something th something that I want for everybody as well um, and I want to be here you know 
know, working together with our seniors, actually convening tables with them and asking them, what is it that you would like to see in the east side here? What is it in our system, you know, in our city that's like not working for you? I know that making sure that they are able to live in their home uh, and, and afford it is important. I want our city to actually be held accountable to making sure that we are in ADA accessible community as well. And uh, one of the reasons why, you know, I continue to go and visit our senior homes every single year is really to engage them, make sure that they are at the center of our democracy. Terry Chow. Yes, I think, um, so the three things that I'm working on directly address and impact seniors because I believe when we solve for the most vulnerable in our community, we're able to solve it for everybody else. So my core things that I'm working around economic development, so how we increase opportunity and growth here, which helps redistribute the tax base so then the burden isn't on a lot of senior households who um, tell me often when I'm at doors that they see their tax bill increasing um, year after year. Another piece I'm really passionate about too is the issue of housing. I care, my uh, another key piece is maintaining and preserving housing. So how do we help seniors access programs that help them fix up their homes, weatherize their homes, keep home costs down so it remains affordable? And last but not least, I care a lot about creating safe, great neighborhoods for folks to cross the street. In addition to that, I care a lot about public safety. So how do we make sure that when seniors call, that they're being responded to, when uh, particularly in hot spots of the neighborhood um, and, and in areas where they feel like they can't address some of the problems because they are seniors or they are in wheelchairs? So how do we work in partnership with the police to make that happen. The order of the next three are Kasim Busuri, Greg Copeland, and Alexander Bourne. Kasim Busuri. Thank you. Um, they are, are many things that I've already been working on and will continue to work on. My legislative aid, the number one calls <laughs> we get at our office is from senior citizens uh, to our office with, with concerns and issues that, that they get with within the neighborhood, so Scott has been great at um, of, of of working with our our senior community and and making sure that the the issues that they bring up is taken care of right away that same day. Um, other things that I've been working on is making sure that they have access um, accessibility to affordable um, uh, uh, groceries and and food that's nearby, so they don't have to drive out or go far, and they can walk to uh, those grocery stores. Um, so with the, with the development of the Hillcrest Golf Course as well, um, I would love to see more senior housing um, and developments in that location where they could easily access uh, uh, shopping, uh, the parks, and everything they need in order to have a, a happy uh, uh, life. Greg Copeland. Greg Copeland. Yeah, the, the, the first thing I think we need to do is recognize that uh, many seniors, and I speak as the only uh, senior citizen uh, running for, for this office. I had my uh, 65th. That's quite an accomplishment, you know. Now you, you know. Anyway, uh, one thing I can tell you is that we need to do something about our taxes. You know, you can't have this, this sort of uh, never, never land idea that you can afford to see a $392 tax bill increase on the median value home in District 5. You can't have that and say that you're for seniors. Seniors are getting a 1.6% increase in Social Security. Do you realize that compared to a 22.3 or 1 or whatever percent you want to put on it with the city tax bill is crazy? And don't forget, we got the county after us and we got the school board after us too. So if you want to do something for seniors, you keep the spending down. You make the government work harder instead of adding 54 people as they've done in the last two years. Alexander Bourne. You'd think after all these questions, excuse me, all these responses that we'd got an answer to the question. I think the question was surrounding, uh, do we have a plan uh, to make senior citizens feel safe? The answer uh, for me is no, I don't have a plan. Uh, but I can definitively say that I have been in communication with uh, many of the seniors that are actually in here tonight uh, to discuss how we can move towards a measurable solution. Public safety is a huge concern for not only myself, but uh, all of uh, I believe most people here in the city of St. Paul. Uh, the fact of the matter is we really want to make sure that our seniors are able to age in place. I do agree wholeheartedly with much of what has already been said. 
um, a couple things that I actually personally do on my free time uh, for the citizen, excuse me, senior citizens here uh, in the community. I have a group of youth that I work with that uh, go around and provide uh, lawn service uh, to our senior citizens in the in the uh, summer and fall months, uh, but also in the winter months, we make sure that we are uh, helping them out with their uh, shoveling and things along those lines. So um, thank you. All right, thank you. The next question will go first to Kasim Busuri, then Alexander Bourne, and then Danielle Swift. Uh, and it is, what are your plans to reduce crime on the east side? Kasim Busuri. Thank you. <clears throat> so I have worked as a youth violence prevention consultant for the city of Minneapolis and worked with them closely on the uh, group violence intervention strategies, which they put in place three years ago. <clears throat> and today, the city council got a presentation about group violence intervention, <coughs> excuse me, group violence intervention strategies at the city hall um, by a consultant from Minneapolis about how to reduce crime. I'm glad to see that our mayor and other city council members are taking actions today uh, to, to look at this issue. The city of St. Paul does not have a plan or a strategy to reduce crime. And the best way to do it is by introducing group violence intervention strategies, which is coined by John Jay College in New York. And it would work for our city. It would reduce the crime. It would take a whole community to stop the crime in St. Paul. And, and we started the conversation with the NAACP uh, meeting a few weeks ago about how we can come together as a community to, to reduce the crime together. Thank you. Alexander Bourne. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, what are your plans to reduce crime on the east side? Sure. Um, about a month ago, I partnered with the Sheriff's Department, uh, local nonprofit organizations, small businesses here in the community, as well as community members uh, to have a rally against gun violence, asking for game bangers to put their guns down. Uh, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. Uh, uh, Kasim Basuri here actually was one of those elected officials, uh, excuse me, uh, officials uh, that uh, actually participated in that. Uh, from that uh, came uh, what we are now working on and I think uh, will get us some real results. Um, it's surrounding expungements, employment. Uh, what we are looking to do, and I, I'm going to run about five seconds over, so bear with me. I'm sorry, Ms. Joanne. But I really want you all to know this. Uh, what we're working on right now is expungements uh, in partnership with the uh, county attorney's office, the state uh, through the governor's office. Um, what we want to do is provide expungements for uh, not only uh, those that have been convicted of any sort of crime, but also those that have simply been arrested for a crime. A lot of individuals uh, get arrested, uh, but never charged. And so what we want to do is get those expungements uh, taken care of, uh, because those individuals face a lot of the same hardships as those uh, that have actually been convicted of a crime. Thank We're you. Also Thank you. Thank you. Danielle Swift? Um, I think that I volunteer with a group called Root and Restore, and we explore community alternative approaches to community violence. Um, in May, I, I did an event at Cinco de Mayo. I had a, a, a I had an, a, excuse me, I had a booth there, and we brought barbers in to cut hair to build connections with these young men because we know that they're there and we know that they're participating in violence. Um, so extending effort to build relationships with these young men. Um, like I stated earlier, they are people and they are members of our community. Um, I think putting more resources towards mentorship and also resources towards basic needs again, like housing and job stability um, and, those, and education, um, rec centers and programming to keep youth busy. Uh, so that we can take a more proactive approach rather than be reactionary with just throwing police at an issue. Like when I stated earlier, violence, um, the, root, the root cause to violence is poverty. Okay, the next three are Terry Tao, Nelsie Yang, and Greg, Greg Copeland. All right, thank you. I think, th uh, for me, plans to reduce crime on the east side, there's both a short-term and a long-term strategy. The short-term are things like uh, gun buyback programs, because people are really alarmed about the number of guns that are, are currently on the street. 
There's also um, little things that we can actually do. A number of neighbors I talked to talk about increasing lights in alleyways and on streets so that people feel a gen uh, greater sense of safety in their neighborhood. That becomes a short-term and less expensive way to address uh, crime or potential crime. In the long term, I do agree with Danielle about long-term investments in our young people. We need to engage them around things that they're interested in, such as arts and entrepreneurship. We've got a couple projects happening here on the east side, particularly at the old Swedish Bank building that will be about uh, bringing some youth together on arts, uh, on, on arts related projects. And I think that's going to be really key. You know, an economic development strategy, giving folks a job and giving folks an alternative makes people believe that there's other things to do besides be engaged in a life of crime. Nelsie Yang. Uh, thank you so much for this question. This is a, a question very near and dear to my heart um, because I also have family members who have been incarcerated before. Um, you know, I work in, at Take Action Minnesota as a criminal justice reform organizer, and that really means working to dismantle the systems in our community that actually do not work for us. And we know that the criminal justice system is actually really deeply rooted in racism and sexism and corporate greed. And that's why when we look at communities most hit by it, you know, the east side is something, it, it's, you know, it, it feels so urgent to me because we are the, the, the target that's most hit. And I just want to name that. Um, you know, uh, when it comes to this, like uh, as a as a council member, you can definitely count on me to make sure that our public dollars are really being invested in our families, children, and especially our public schools. Um, I will fight to make sure that you know in the east side here, I actually want to see all day recreation centers and uh, parks, uh, green spaces, you know, being preserved and built here, and also all day libraries as well. And in, in addition to that, it's actually really important for people to be able to make have a roof over their head, make a livable wage, so that they don't go out into the streets doing things that are harmful for them. And these are things I'm going to be pushing for as a council member. Greg Copeland. Yes, uh, you know it's it's pretty distressing to hear the uh, sitting councilman uh, tell us that the city doesn't have a plan on uh, public safety. That that uh, that's concerning, and I do have my light that I'm paying for and have been paying for on my alley for a long time. I was the uh, local uh, guy on the block. My uh, telephone number uh, and my. Um, uh, email and everything were out to everybody in the neighborhood and they used to call me 911 because that's my birthday. When I had uh, drug dealers ask me why I was always calling the police, I told them it was my favorite number. I think what we had, and I'm going back to the days when uh, Norm Coleman was the mayor and we had block clubs and we engaged our neighbors and we made this a cultural thing and we had a school system that employed uh, school resource officers uh, and wasn't afraid to. You have to have a culture that starts at the, at the schoolhouse door, that uh, supports uh, law and order, that supports respect for human rights. This is not something that just gets acquired out of the uh, thin air. All right, the next question, and I would like to ask each candidate to make sure that you stop at the one minute mark. Um, it makes this whole process a lot easier. So. There was never a plan. 30 seconds. You okay. have 30 seconds. There was never a plan ever since I've been appointed to the, to the city council. I've been making an approach to the mayor. I made those approaches to the mayor to introduce GVI, group violence intervention. I made approaches to the uh, council president and I didn't get any response. I've made those comments and worked with them and tried to continue to work with them to bring a plan and we still don't have a plan. It is not because um, I'm sitting there and doing nothing. I've been trying to get these plans put into places and today they just talked about it. Thank you. All right, the next question will go first to Greg Copeland, then to Terry Tao, then to Kasim Basuri. And it is, would you commit to opposing any attempt to repeal ranked choice voting in St. Paul, and what's the basis for your answer? No, actually, I would not oppose uh, a repeal of ranked choice voting. I uh, voted against that. I advocated against that. Uh, there were a number of people uh, in the uh, DFL at the time, many of them are living here in Ward 6. Uh, uh, Chuck Repke, in fact, was a leader of those uh, not wanting to see a ranked choice voting. Uh, in fact, it's never uh, served its purpose in St. Paul. We've never had to, uh, to go to uh, the multiple uh, balloting to come up with our ballot decisions. I think we can make our uh, choices known, uh, you know, the, the old-fashioned way. He or she who gets the most votes uh, 
gets lucky and gets to go to the uh, council meetings or the commission meetings or whatever, or the school board meetings. Uh, the school board's been elected this way and still is. Uh, so I don't know, are, are we doing something wrong there? Uh, I mean, aside from the fact that the teachers union buys the school board seats, I would say it's an okay election, right? You know. Terry Tao. Well, I think the fact that there's six candidates up here running for Ward 6 means there's something about ranked choice voting that actually works. It means people who normally wouldn't be part of the process can throw their names in the, in the ring and also participate and share their message with folks. Because um, we all, you know, unfortunately the thing right now is it could be a two-person race. And I think what I hear from folks is even with the six of us running, that they still feel like there's not a lot of choice. And so, um, so, but I, so I'm glad you're here tonight to, to hear from the six of us. So I, uh, I would commit, uh, the language is kind of funky, but I would be okay if folks uh, oppose anyone who's trying to oppose ranked choice voting, uh, because I think um, th it, this is exactly what it's doing here, is that it's allowing folks to participate in our democracy in ways that they normally wouldn't have. Thank you. Kasim Basuri. Um, repeat the question again, please. Would you commit to opposing any attempt to repeal ranked choice voting in St. Paul, and what's the basis for your answer? No, I would not. Um, bring a proposal to re repeal it or support it to uh, repeal or support anybody that would be repealing the uh, ranked choice voting. It gives um, um, many opportunities, as uh, Terry said, to other candidates to be able to run and to have m more people that are, are able to run gives more voices to the people. So at the end of the day, we'll get to choose, the people get to choose who they want and they can rank um, based on their, uh, their choices. Um, and it gives you the option of saying, you know, instead of just saying, um, my, if I can't vote for the person that I want, I'm not going to vote. Um, it gives people option to vote. So getting more people on the ballot helps people get out to vote. And we'll see that uh, this year that, that we, will sh we should see higher numbers in, in voting this year. Thank you. Okay, next are Nelsie Yang, Alexander Bourne, and Danielle Swift. Nelsie Yang. Hey everybody, yes, I fully support ranked choice voting. Um, as an organizer, um, you know, I've actually been at the Capitol very uh, active and vocal about uh, supporting fair, uh, ranked choice voting and making sure that we don't preempt this. Uh, there are, you know, many, uh, many of our representatives or elected officials in office who work very hard to strip away a lot of the things that actually build our democracy and give people choice. Um, and so it, I support ranked choice voting and will do everything I can to oppose uh, anybody or elected officials who are working to dismantle this. And I want to share that it's because I've actually, um, you know, I want to name that in what we see in politics is that typically it's like people in the status quo, people you know who are a part of like the system, who you know they're typically the ones who get elected. It's like you know maybe much more convenient for them too. I've seen many races where people of color, people from very disenfranchised communities, get elected, and they are the best voice representing very diverse communities. And I have worked on those campaigns myself, especially in Minneapolis and um, in St. Paul here too. And so I want to continue um, protecting that and making sure we have that. Alexander Bourne. I support uh, ranked choice voting uh, in its entirety. I think it's great for democracy. I think uh, it's nice to uh, have a choice. Um, but I also agree with uh, the words that have been so, uh, spoken before me. Um, I personally try to promote ranked choice voting at every chance I get. Uh, that being said, um, if you have a candidate of choice in mind uh, that is already your first choice other than myself, um, I ask that you take the necessary steps to engage with me, allow me to engage with you uh, so that I can earn your second, if not your third choice vote on November the 5th. Thank you. Danielle Swift. Um, I'm for ranked choice voting. I think that it, it promotes democracy. I think we want to encourage people to participate. Um, I, I really want to recognize that what we have in front of you, this panel of people, has never happened in Ward 6 before. It has never happened before. And this panel of people in front of you is a true representation of what Ward 6 really is. This is a beautiful site, and it's really an honor to be in this race. Um, so I'm for ranked choice voting. I'm all for whatever it takes to get people to participate in the process because it's lacking. Um, I think that as we continue on with this, just like you see more candidates than you've ever seen, we'll start to see more voters than we've ever seen. Ward 6 has some of the lowest voter turnout in the entire state of Minnesota. Um, and so I think that that's something where if we have more options and more choices that we will see more, more, more participation. Okay, the next question will go first to Danielle Swift, then Greg Copeland, then Nelsie Yang. 
And the question is, where do you stand on the $400 million rush line dedica dedicated busway project? Do you think bus rapid transit on 35E is an option? Yes, um, I think that a bus, ra uh, a, a rapid bus transit on 35E is an option. I think that it's it's always an option. Anything can always be an option. Where there is a will, there is a way. Um, I have to be honest. I don't know specifics about the 400 million dollar deal, but I do know that transportation is extremely important, especially as people get pushed out of the inner city and into surrounding suburbs. People need to be able to get back into the city and come to go to work. Um, a lot of times, it's to come back to go to church and that sort of thing um, because we want to keep our communities intact. Um, so there are a lot of different people who are in various surrounding areas. Um, and I think that the transportation will help people who are in the city get out to jobs as well. So I think it creates opportunities both ways to, to provide that level of transportation. Greg Copeland. Thank you. Uh, this plan is an absolute disaster. If you enjoy the Bruce Vento Trail, if you value the environment that's created by uh, the enrichment that's occurred over the last uh, 25 years, uh, you know, then you are not going to be in favor of tearing out all of those trees that we are so fortunate to have on the right of way that uh, is now the Bruce Vento Trail. Uh, we have spent a ton of money. We, the state of Minnesota, out on 35, the Min Pass lanes from downtown St. Paul right up to White Bear where this uh, crazy uh, bus line wants to go. Uh, we've got a whole separate dedicated bus lane, north and south, brand new concrete. It gets you back and forth in about 12 minutes, uh, either way. So, you know, we don't need it. And, and frankly, what we need is a bus that goes from Payne Avenue to Rice Street on Maryland. You know, we don't need to spend $400 million, county commissioners, on, oh, I'm getting the stop sign. You know, and that's the problem. We're spending the money in the wrong places. Nelsie Yang. I support it. I'm very excited about it. You know, I um, have, there's been many times where I've actually jumped up the east side here being a very public uh, transit friendly um, place for all of our working families, for it to, for us to actually be relying on green, new, uh, green, new, and uh, renewable energy here in our community. And one of the reasons why is because I actually think about all of the moments when I've talked to families who tell me, oh, Nelsie, it takes me like, you know, a t it takes me like a 20, 20 minute, 30 minute walk just to get to where I need to be every single day. And I want to, the east side here to be accessible for every single person. Um, and I want to acknowledge that like one of the reasons why, you know, we are the side of the city, like not getting this type of investment is that we've just been so marginalized. Um, and, and we need a council member who is here actually put pushing and engaging with people to make sure that we create this type of community. I really look forward to convening tables with neighbors here, making sure that, you know, your needs are actually met. And when it comes to being able to travel to, you know, other places in the east side here or across St. Paul or to work, that it's a very uh, easy and convenient commute for you. All right, the next three to answer will be Alexander Bourne, Kasim Busuri, and Terry Tao. Alexander Bourne. I do not support the rush line. Um, I think it's uh, bad for many of the reasons that Mr. Copeland outlined. Um, I do believe that we should uh, be investing in a uh, transportation system, not only from White, excuse me, Payne Avenue uh, to uh, Rice Street, but from White Bear Avenue all the way to Como Avenue. Um, I think the rush line, it excuse me, it puts our prized waterways and our um, our, our prized natural resources at jeopardy, um, and as an environmentalist at heart, um, yeah, I don't support that at all. Kasim Busuri. I don't support the rush line going through the 35E, and because it takes away the opportunity for people in Weber Avenue to, to see the east side, um, to shop at the east side, um, and I do support not putting the rush line through Bruce Ventro. I don't want it to go through Bruce Vento. We can put it through McKnight Avenue where the Hillcrest Golf Course is being built. Uh, and it could go through that area. And it could go through White Bear Avenue. Um, there's many ways to reroute this, but we do need this rush line to go through the east side so that people from White Bear Avenue can shop and eat and, and, and 
promote the economy of the east side. So not only is it a transit site for us, it's an opportunity to boost the economy of the east side. Um, it's gonna be going through uh, uh, Phelan Avenue, it's gonna go through and stop by uh, Payne Avenue, and people can actually stop and eat and, 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 and walk to those different shops. Thank you. Terry Tao. <coughs> so I actually sit on the Rush Lines Policy Advisory Committee. I'm the only east side resident that um, sits on that committee. And so I am fully in support of the line. Uh, I do not support a 35 alignment. We would be subsidizing suburban folks to come in and bypass us in the city altogether. This is also what people thought when we should do the light rail just along 94. We said no because we knew that the folks along University Avenue, on Rice Street, Frogtown, and Midway needed it to get between areas. And it's the same thing here. It will actually have six stops here coming up on the Phelan Boulevard and coming through the neighborhood. And I believe it can exist concurrently with the Bruce Vento Trail. I believe we can make, a, we can uh, a, a deal with the uh, the issues around the environmental preservation that needs to be done too. As and when I talk to neighbors around there too, they're really interested in how that's going to work out work as well. But and because it is about the economic development, the studies that they've looked at says a lot of the growth around the stops is equivalent to light rail growth. And so what we saw on the green line was that the billion dollars worth of the green line development led to a billion dollars worth of investment. Thank you. The next question will go first to Nelsie Yang then Terry Tao, then Alexander Bourne, and here it is. There's reason to believe single family zoning contributes to the housing crunch. What is an acceptable level of density to replace it with? Um, well, I just want to share that for me, like I support higher density here in our community. We're going to be a, a very, um, a growing community where I really imagine like a lot of young folks, you know, wanting to move into the east side here, want to build, uh, you know, a family here and, uh, you know, a lot of businesses wanting to come here as well. Um, I want to talk specifically about, um, you know, uh, development on the Hillcrest Golf Course. Like I really want to see mixed use housing there along with like businesses there as well. And for us to have affordable housing across income and family size. I've talked to neighbors around the area there who, you know, are, are always very curious about um, what we as candidates want. I've been asking them, what is it that you would like instead? Um, and I've really uh, gotten to a point where, you know, uh, this this uh, response here is like a crafted response from neighbors there who care deeply about making sure that they're able to um, live in, in peace and harmony there, but, you know, are welcoming to families as well. Terry Tao. Thank you. I would be supportive of zoning similar to what we did, in the city of Minneapolis just did in their 2040 comprehensive plan, um, which allows, if if folks want to move, you know, it's not saying they have to, but if they want to, up to a fourplex on their property. Now, of course, with 40-foot lots that are the average size in the city, it will vary about what that must look like, but we, the fact of the matter is we do need density. We do add more and more folks to the city here. Density, for me, also um, translates into, what I would like to see happen is translates into home ownership, because when we know when you have a duplex, you have someone helping you uh, subsidize you, the mortgage, but in addition to that, you're providing housing to one, two, possibly three families. I also am supportive of accessory dwelling units or small homes on people's properties as well. That becomes a little cheaper way than trying to build a brand new house if you like the house you're living in now. But that is not citywide yet. I would certainly encourage that. I spent nine years on the Planning Commission where we looked at a lot of these deep issues around zoning. And I think now is a good time for us as the city of St. Paul for our growth to look at um, increasing density. Alexander Bourne. I think increased uh, density is a great thing, um, especially given that we have an uh, ever-growing uh, population of immigrants here on the uh, east side uh, and as a city as a whole. Um, I think that, um, yeah, it's, it's great. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, but also, I will uh, use the rest of my time to talk about uh, the fact how I do believe that we need to establish better zoning methods that encourage the development of the various levels of affordable housing uh, that the market is demanding, such as artists' lofts, um, uh, and things along those lines. Thank you. Okay, the next three are Greg Copeland, Danielle Swift, and Kasim Basuri. Greg Copeland? Yeah, I, I do not support uh, the Minneapolis plan coming to St. Paul. Uh, they're going to adopt that on Friday over there at the Minneapolis uh, City Council. St. Paul ought to protect St. Paul's uh, history and it ought to protect the homeowners' investments by not going willy-nilly and making a unilateral decision over the entire city that anywhere there's single-family housing, now we can have four-story buildings on 40-foot lots. How insane is that, folks? 
I mean, the reality is what we ought to do on, in Ward 6 is we ought to protect the investment that's already out there that the city has let lie fallow, and that's all these vacant homes. We've got hundreds of vacant homes. We've got hundreds of vacant lots. We've got all kinds of property that the city is promising to develop for future housing. Anybody want to buy a golf course? The city did, and they don't know what the heck they're even going to do with it. You know, we've got plenty of land to redevelop for senior housing, and I'm a senior, and you know what? As a guy who's in a big house all by himself, I'd be the first guy in line. But to go Minneapolis over here, forget about it. Danielle Swift. Um, yes, I would support looking at zoning to change it so that we could have more density. I sit on the Board of Zoning Appeals, and so anytime that someone requests a variance, they come in, and a lot of times it has to do with something building something that's going to be bigger than what's allowed on a on a 5,000 square foot lot. Um, but there have been some very creative designs that have come in um, that are aesthetically pleasing and they still fit a lot of the other codes that we're asking, maybe just a little bit bigger. Um, I think that it would be very cool to see like fourplexes and duplexes. That way we could get creative with like cooperative living and um, it, it would really add to the level of affordability. And I think the way that our city is growing, we don't really have an option to choose whether to increase the density or not at this point. But I think that there is a way that we can do it smart and something that will still look really cool. Kasim Musuri. Um, I would uh, support uh, higher than city zoning. Um, it's for me. It's it, it's the American dream, right? So I came here as a refugee. I wanted to have my own home, and the way things are happening now with the price of constructions of of homes that are in the four hundred, five hundred thousand ranges, you're better off building bigger um, and and ma building duplexes and fourplexes to accommodate for the. Uh, for the differences in in, um, in in pricing of the of the home, so I would support it, um, but I would also want to preserve our um, historical and um, historical sites and houses that exist within St. Paul. So there's a lot of beautiful homes that were built here, and they're historical. We should preserve those areas and make sure that we do have um, guidelines to preserving some of those homes as well. Thank you. All right, the next question will be uh, asked, uh, starting with uh, Alexandra Bourne and just going straight down the line. So uh, it is, what is your plan for improving the relationship between law enforcement and communities of color while ensuring that law enforcement remains empowered to protect our community? Alexandra Bourne. Read it one more time, sorry to be that guy. What is your plan for improving the relationship between law enforcement and communities of color while ensuring that law enforcement remains empowered to protect our community? Um, I think we can um, start by making sure that we understand that law enforcement is a part of our community. Um, there is no in-between. Uh, however, I do believe that the police department right now does not adequately reflect who we are as a community, and I am more than willing to uh, continue to help bridge that relationship. I think uh, my partnership with the sheriff's office a couple weeks, excuse me, a few weeks ago, I think was a great start in the right direction. Uh, I am a trusted uh, community member, uh, particularly uh, in the community that uh, we are looking to address when it comes to uh, gun violence and uh, different forms of crimes that are taking place in the city, just having grown up right here on the east side in a highly impoverished community. Uh, thank you. Kasim Basuri. So earlier today, there was a great event that was happening here at, Ar uh, at Arlington Rec Center. The police officers were giving out candy to community members um, right outside. This is part of the community uh, community engagement initiative that the city has and the St. Paul Police Department has. Uh, the best way to rebuild uh, trust with the community and the police department is to have more engagements with the police department. Uh, for the last nine nine years, I've worked with the St. Paul Police Department in community engagement with the East African community and with the uh, with the St. Paul community through the ambassadors program that I was working with uh, the youth and 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 crime prevention uh, uh, activities. So. 
it, the best way is to have more activities where our officers are engaging with our community, just like the one that happened today, earlier today, uh, with uh, with uh, them handing out candy and, and communicating and engaging with our community. Um, so that way they reflect. And another thing is um, the, the police academy that's coming up for this coming year, uh, we cannot cut the police department's budget because the coming up academy is one of the most, most diverse police academy that we'll ever see in the history of St. Paul. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not supporting a, a budget cut for the St. Paul Police Department. Thank you. Greg Copeland. Right. Well, I, 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 I think we're going up the, the wrong street with uh, some of this discussion about, uh, you know, what are we going to do for communities of color? We, we had a commentary here by many of the, the folks sitting at the table about how beautiful our community is because of its diversity. I think we need to respect that and treat ourselves to the uh, good old American, uh, we're all equal before the law and no man or woman is above the law. And frankly, I think the engagement that people who have children want, whatever their color, is to have bad guys get picked up and taken down to the jailhouse and get scheduled for uh, a court appearance. Candidly, you know, letting people off and going, turning your back. Uh, I noticed the Minneapolis plan was released and, and certain crimes, oh no, we're not gonna pursue the, uh, the uh, bad actors in the community, uh, you know, uh, at the Minneapolis Police Department. Again, another Minneapolis idea we don't need to bring over here. I went to the uh, uh, Arlington Hills Lutheran Church meeting at the NAACP had, and nobody Daniel. there was taking the position that we ought to do for one that we don't do for the other. Danielle Swift. Can you please repeat the question? Yes, what is your plan for improving the relationship between law enforcement and communities of color while ensuring that law enforcement remains empowered to protect our community? Okay, um, well one thing I would like to start by saying is that police having power over our community is a part of a narrative problem that we have. Um, power lies within community. Uh, in, in any other instance, we expect community to show up and carry themselves to push their own weight and to do their own work. But in this instance of safety, it's seen that police have to have power over communities of color. That's an initial problem and it's highly problematic um, that it's even in the narrative. So part of the plan for me is to come and to shed the light on things like that, to be able to bring a more robust, robust thought process to solutions that we can implement to see safer communities. Terry Tao? Yeah, I, I, I do think it implies like, because when we have to do with communities of color, the police can't do their jobs. I think most communities still want, still want the police to do their jobs. I think what they're also saying too is please just don't attack us because of the color of our skin as well. And so, and we know right now there are huge, uh, huge instances of uh, disproportionality between communities of color and the police about who gets arrested more, as well as um, incidences with law enforcement and communities of color. And so a plan and a way to do this is to build relationships, not necessarily have the police hand out candy, but have the police go to places where communities gather and do listening, um, do listening and, and building relationships and trust we need to have folks um, out in the, uh, you know, on the streets, you know, as well as on bike and doing that type of patrol where they're um, w um, more familiar in the neighborhoods um, and not just, you know, um, in their substations or just in the cars often at, at times too. And so I think, um, uh, I think they can still do their jobs. Most people still want them to do their jobs. If my house gets broken into, I still want them to show up. I just don't want to be treated differently as a result of that. Nelsie Yang. Um, I also, you know, Danielle, thank you so much for uplifting about the narrative um, being, you know, very, very ironic how it's been named like that. I also want to just really touch on that as well because, you know, people, I want to name that like folks of color, right? And I'm, I'm going to talk about my experience as somebody who does racial equity organizing. We're not here, right? Like looking for, okay, let's like better our relationship by, you know, meeting together. You know, actually like what we actually need is like systemic change in our police department, in our criminal justice reform form in our criminal justice system as well. And like that really looks like us making sure we are investing our public dollars into mental health co-responders. Like, you know, if we actually, if we, if we had a, a relationship that was working between the police and people of color especially, like that means that we should, we should not have people of color, you know, who are dying 
you know, out in the streets. We shouldn't have people who have a mental health condition out in the streets, you know, like losing their life um, and families being torn apart and living in trauma. Um, so mental health correspondence is something that I'm actually like working on personally um, with leaders, you know, all over. Um, and I also want to talk about, you know, make, making sure we have council members who are deeply asking questions about racial profi profiling and getting statistics about this. Okay, now uh, for the next question, we're gonna go down the row again, the opposite direction. And this is the question, what is your stance on our trash system and the upcoming referendum? Nelsie Yang? Thank you, I'm voting yes on the referendum and I will be organizing people to also vote yes as well. Um, I, you know, I just wanna say personally that I, um, you know, it's, it's pretty bizarre to see um, the trash issue be one of the top issues. Um, and, and I want to name that if I were a council member when this uh, contract was being crafted, it would have looked definitely like very different. Because as a union steward, I'm somebody who's always fighting to make sure that the voices of people are being centered in all our decision making in our contracts. I would have pushed for shared opt out options. Um, and I really believe that, you know, families who are getting city services, that they should actually be saving money and that we should be fighting for the best deal. Um, and I acknowledge that that didn't happen. Um, but that's why I'm having conversations with neighbors and asking them right now from the, from the get-go, what is it that you'd like to see? Because the negotiations will come up, and I want to make sure that you have a voice at the table and that you're not left out. And that's a commitment that I am bringing with me to the table as a council member and also a commitment that you will see from me every single time You know, we are here having a discussion about how to vote as a community. Terry Tao. Yes, I too will be voting yes on the referendum. I was always a yes vote, never wavered from it, because I know that there were deep inequities with um, the trash system in the first place. Some people in a lot of communities where they didn't speak English, they never knew they could negotiate their trash bill. They actually thought it was like their utility bill, and they had to pay it every month to the provider. And so um, I see it as a deep issue around equity, as well as um, f having an, less an envirom uh, a greater environmental impact by having less trucks on the street and from a public safety perspective. I know the process in terms of getting the contract there was extremely flawed. I know we didn't have much participation here on the east side. I think if we had actually done a pilot here, we would have figured it out for the rest of the city. You know, a lot of times policy work's not very exciting, but when you have people at the table who can bring up these issues and talk about the impact on poor communities, seniors, communities of color, we can make the policy right in the first place. So yes, it's not a perfect contract, but I also want folks to realize what the implication of no means and on what it's doing to shift the burden from individual folks to to property taxes as well. Danielle Swift. This is a tough one um, because it's it seems to be high on the profile list and I just always felt like man it'd be great if we could organize around something that was affecting people uh, like their lives you know. Um, so I had to reach out and and talk to a lot of people to really understand this and this is just me being somebody who doesn't understand what a referendum is um, or you know, how this charter works. And so I had to educate myself on that. And a lot of people I still don't even think know how that's happening. From, on, from what I've learned, um, of a no vote would mean that the 17% spread across the city, it would cost less for people who had lower market valued homes to pay for their trash. And as far as equity is concerned, it makes sense to me to vote no. That way, if we're doing a percentage, I mean, that spells equity to me. If it costs less money because you have less money or you live in an area of lower income, it makes sense to pay less for your trash. I think it would add uh, to the affordability factor that we all like talking so much about. Greg Copeland. Yeah, I, I will tell you, I uh, was an original signer of the petition uh, to put this on the ballot. Uh, I, I sat for 12 years on our charter commission, and believe me, it's written in plain English, and it's embarrassing that, that as a city, as the capital city, that we have to go to the Supreme Court and ask our justices, who normally don't even meet in August, to read the charter to tell us that we can uh, make an initiative of, on our ballot. How ridiculous is that? Um, you know, frankly, this just shows you how much we need a, an entire new city council. This is much bigger than the trash issue. Using uh, the trash issue to intimidate voters uh, to tell us that we have to pay $27 million more because they made a mistake and gave the store away when they gave the contract to the haulers? Uh, under what system does the, does the contractor get to do the billing you know, when it's supposed to be a city system and the city council becomes what? Only an agent for collections. This is insane and we gotta stop. Vote no on election day, please. We need your no vote. Kasim Basuri. 
um, I've been consistent and I am a no vote for the trash uh, or, uh, ordinance. Uh, the reason behind it um, is, and I want to thank Danielle for hitting on the spot about the equity. When it is put on the tax rolls, it is going to be more equitable for the east side. But not the point, the reason why I'm voting no is because to protect the charter of the city, to protect the rights of the citizen, 6,400 people petitioned for this to be on the ballot in 2018. We would not be in the situation we are in today um, if the council at that time listened to the people who they serve. The people are our executive directors and we need to listen to them. By, by, by uh, threatening the people of St. Paul and saying this is gonna go on the tax levy when there are other options, it's wrong and that's why I'm voting no. Thank you. Alexander Bourne. I'm all for organized trash. Um, however, I am uh, supporting a no vote on November 5th. I was actually one of the organizers uh, that sat on Selby Avenue last year uh, before it blew up as big as it is now, uh, getting people to collect those signatures. Uh, and so, but the problem is uh, the implementation process, you know, the lack of transparency, the lack of inclusion. Another example of government coming into our community telling us what's best for us as if we're not rational and practical thinkers on our own. That is the problem. Um, at this point, we need to be asking ourselves um, which one of these candidates sitting up here is going to support. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, how are we going to support a subsidizing of the system in the intermediate of a new contract? I do believe a new contract is foreseeable. Uh, however, it is not going to be until uh, the end of its five-year uh, term. And people need to understand that. Uh, morally speaking, uh, this is a problem. Uh, I understand that we will pay a little bit more over time, uh, but that's something that we are willing to uh, do as a no voter, uh, simply for the betterment of our community and to take uh, the power back from the government and put it in our community. Thank you. Okay, the next question will be asked first of Danielle Swift, then Nelsie Yang, then Kasim Basuri. And it is, do you support the mayor's budget proposal to move $70,000 from the newly formed police mental health unit toward the fire department. How could you support the funding of both the mental health unit and the fire department? Yes, I support it. Um, part of the volunteer work that I do is looking into the statistics of who's getting pulled over by the St. Paul Police Department. Um, and it's like a third more black men. Um, and so I think that if we were just to be more intentional about like who's where, you know, we're not just sending police out to harass people on the street, we can be more particular about where they're going to actually work and do, do crime. Moving that over to the police department then, or to the fire department, someone wouldn't be showing up with a gun. Um, most of the cases that we see in police fatalities are mental, he mental health crises. Um, and so, you know, the thought of uh, someone getting a call of a mental health breakout, uh, a mental health episode, someone who I love, I wouldn't want a police officer to be called. Um, I would much rather to see EMTs and mental health professionals just show up. Nelsie Yang. Can you, re can you repeat that question again? Sure. Do you support the mayor's budget proposal to move $70,000 from the newly formed police mental health unit toward the fire department? How could you support the funding of both the mental health unit and the fire department? Um, thanks for the question. This is actually like one of the first few, the first time I've you know been asked this, um, and I'd love to hear more. Um, and I actually just want to take a moment to really talk about um, not not about this, but about how important it is to actually be investing our public dollars into our families and children to make sure that families here in the East Side are getting our fair share. When we talk about you know um, investing money into the police department, firefighters department, I'm always I'm always wondering like how 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 are they how are these departments actually responding to families here in the East Side? I, I would love to actually dig into that you know as a council member, really dig into that with our uh, district councils as well, you know our leaders here um, who are here representing our community and fighting to make sure that we have representation. That's the bigger question on the table here for me because um, I know how how disenfranchised and marginalized our community here has. Been. Been, and there's so much urgency around it and we actually need to be we need a council member, member who's here pushing that and talking about that with the mayor and really creating partnership and making sure that they are really working on the issues that matter to us 
Right, Kasim Basuri. I would want to make a correction to that question. Um, I believe the mayor went back on that proposal um, and left the money to the police department, and it, the number was actually more than seventy thousand. Um, and I would support putting funding to both the police department and the fire department to have uh, um, mental health uh, uh, specialists that are with them at all time. Um, I heard about a case where a firefighter went to a hospital because they got called by the, uh, by the clinic and the person was trying to commit suicide by a law enforcement. And the, the, the fire department did not have a mental health uh, person with them and didn't know what to do. They were asking the doctor what they wanted them to do. So this is the situations that our fire, fire department is put in. Uh, this is the situation uh, our police officers are put in. Uh, with the help of the Ramsey County, uh, um, the police department will continue its uh, mental health unit that's, that's with them, and it's growing actually, um, so that department um, could use some more funding, but the funding that was in, in, in question was for something else, and that money was left with the St. Paul Police Department. Next will be Alexander Bourne, Greg Copeland, and Terry Tao. So here's the thing. People need to understand that the police are policing a mentally ill community, okay? And what that means is that our police department should reflect that. I believe that uh, neither the police department or uh, the fire department is fully equipped with the tools necessary to adequately uh, uh, provide great service uh, to its citizens right now. Um, do I support uh, this shift in funds? Um, certainly, simply because right now the appropriations that had been made uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't doing its job. You know, I think uh, many people in the police department kind of took it as a joke. You know, how are you going to pair a mental health professional uh, with one of my partners, excuse me, replace my partner with a mental health profession? And um, I think over time, uh, we saw that reflective in the actions that took course. You know, if I may recall your attention uh, to about a month ago, uh, I believe uh, in this particular instance, when the gentleman was running at the police officer with a uh, knife, he had to been mentally ill. No Great. one in their right mind is going to run at a police officer with a knife Okay, and so, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. And, and I think that our policies that we implement and embrace moving forward uh, should reflect that. Um, and that's via our budget. Great. People need to know that the, the budget is our moral document. Thank you. Greg Copeland. Yeah, this, this is an area that's uh, begging for our attention. Uh, I think $70,000 uh, sounds inadequate, if anything. And frankly, uh, you know, uh, uh, if we want to protect the health of our community at large, the health of our individual citizens that may need mental health treatment and get tied up in some uh, police action because somebody calls 911 and the officer responds and there's uh, not a crisis team to intervene, uh, you know, then we've got a big problem and that's how people end up dead in the street. And you know what? That's not in anybody's interest and none of us in this room want that to happen. So this is an area where we need some systemic uh, reform. We need uh, to get the, all the stakeholders at the table, as they say, on this one. Because we've been getting this one wrong as a community for a long time, for too long. And you know, when you, when you open up a, uh, a uh, homeless shelter and on the first day it's full, as we're told with the second phase of the uh, Catholic uh, uh, Charities Home, uh, you know, we've got a big problem. And we've got to deal with it. And seventy thousand dollars is nothing. I mean, we've got to really look at this. Terry Tao. Yeah, I, I would really, um, I, because I don't have the details, I would really ask what the shift or what was the reason for the shift um, from the money from the police department to the fire department. I, I know it's really hard when we have limited public resources that we do have to make hard choices between each. But for me, as someone who looks at a lot of data and is about accountability, what was that money originally for, right? We do know there is increased calls for mental health, absolutely. But we also know that the fire, as well as the fire department, is increasingly being called for medical services. And so those are really hard trade-offs to make. And for me, I would have to look at what the request was for. In addition to that, what's the impact and the outcome of those, what are those going to be? Was it maybe a fire department in an area that's been seeing an increase in calls, for example? Um, as someone who's been doing a lot of work at the government level, I think what, um, and what I really want to push to is looking at accountability about what we are actually getting from our outcomes. What are we actually investing in and what is being returned back to us? Thank you. 
All right, it is now time for closings. Each candidate gets two minutes for their closing. And we will start the first three candidates uh, to make closings will be um, first Kasim Bussouri, then Alexander Bourne, and then Danielle Swift. Kasim Bussouri. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight, um, this evening, especially on a workday evening, um, to listen to us and so we can listen to you as well. Um, I will continue to work uh, for the East Side and for the citizens of St. Paul to make sure that the rights are not taken away from the people and to give the rights back to the people that it belongs to. That there is balance of, of power. Uh, when the charter change was going, was going to happen, I was one of those people that said, no, this would put too much power in the city council's um, hand and we should keep the power to the people itself. That to, to make sure that we are held accountable as well. Um, I support uh, making sure that we have more resources for our law enforcement community, that we have more funding for uh, fixing our roads, and then also making sure that we have uh, f uh, funding for developments for the east side, uh, especially for Payne Arcade um, and also White Bear Avenue, that we re 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 uh, redevelop those areas to make sure that businesses that are, th are thriving, that will do good in our neighborhoods, move to the east side. I, I want to see an east side where our business uh, 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 corridors are, are thriving, they're growing, they're hiring our young, young folks who are on the streets that need the jobs, um, and that we are investing back into the community that, that, that needs it the most. We are in a highly concentrated uh, area that's concentrated of poverty. We can only get out of that if we work together and we make sure that we develop um, these corridors back to their, uh, to their um, original health. Of, of us prosperity and if those businesses are successful we'll be successful as well and investing more money into our parks um, and continuing to work with uh, uh, our community members again thank you I hope to uh, get your uh, uh, first choice in um, November 5th and thank you again for for allowing me to to uh, to be with you tonight thank you thank you Alexander Bourne thank you uh, the fact of the matter is, this is a historical race, okay? This is the first time in 23 years where we are going to have an opportunity uh, to elect an individual that has the ability uh, to implement and embrace policies that adequately reflects who we are as a community and quite frankly abolish those that do not. I want to be that guy. I'm the only candidate that understands the East Side in its entirety. I grew up here. I've, 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 I've faced these challenges. I've lived in these same conditions that our city and candidates say that they are dedicated to changing. I think lived experience is something that has always been missing from the uh, city council chambers and I want to bring that. Uh, the fact of the matter is we've lost 16 parks and recreation centers in the last uh, 10 years, okay? I want to bring those back, many in which were impoverished communities, okay? So, uh, some in which were right here on the east side. Uh, we are uh, divesting in our youth, and I believe that we need to do the exact opposite. We need to begin to invest our dollars in our youth. We need to make sure our seniors are able to age in place. We need to make sure our immigrants are able to thrive, not only in their business. We need to promote gender uh, equality, racial justice, right, while protecting our prized water spaces, green spaces. We need to, uh, uh, Mr. Copeland alluded to the 150 some odd properties that the city currently have access to. We can solve a lot of our problems right now. We just need an individual to go in there and reprioritize what is best for the city of St. Paul. More importantly, for the east side. I want to be that guy. Allow me. Vote for me uh, November 1st, excuse me, November 5th, first choice. Uh, but if not, give me that second or third choice. I promise you, it won't be a waste. All right? Come on now. <coughs> thank you, Danielle Swift. Oh, I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, and thank you for the hard questions. Um, I've noticed, like, earlier on with candidate forums, a lot of them are kind of like, eh, hey, what are you going to do? We all kind of are saying the same thing. Um, and so it feels good to get to the meat of this because they are very serious issues and it does affect people's everyday life and quality of lives. And that's exactly why I'm running. I want to enhance the quality of life living on the east side for everybody who lives here, from like the very smallest person to the very biggest person, uh, to the homeless people, to the people who are living in big houses as well. Um, I just want to say um, thank you for allowing me to show up in my authenticity. It's something that I've committed to myself jumping into this race. I think that it's important to bring transparency um, to city council. We have a, 
elected officials who come in with this front, um, who may say one thing and then do another. Um, and that's part of the reason why I'm challenging it. That's part of the reason why I'm in the race. And so even though it's been a challenge for me, I try to show up as my true self. I be honest, um, say things how I feel, and I just want to extend a thanks and uh, appreciation for allowing me to show up as my full self. Thank you. The next three will be Terry Tao, Nelsie Yang, and Greg Copeland. Terry Tao. Awesome. Well, thank you again for coming out tonight. I appreciate um, you taking your time to come listen to us. You know, I'm, you know, I have great love for the city. The city's been really good for my family, and, and I really want to see the east side do well. You know, I'm not going to be someone who says, uh, it, we, give me a chance. I've been doing the work in community for 15 years, right? And so investing in organizations, sitting on the board, rolling up my sleeves, and doing the hard work of addressing the hard issues. And I think right now, we cannot afford to have anyone who doesn't just, you know, come in ready with the experience. We cannot wait. We are at the cusp of some really interesting and great opportunities here on the east side and we need to have folks who are going to be ready from day one to get this work started. You know, I've spent my career behind the scenes doing this work, and I'm really excited now to come to the forefront and be a really great advocate and champion for the neighborhood. I, too, will be, I will be honest and real about the struggles that we have in terms of the budget balancing that we have to do, but I also believe that it's about instilling hope and opportunity for the generations to come. Most people just want a dig dignified work, a good place to live, and a uh, good place uh, to call home and an affordable place to call home to raise their families. And I know the Eastside has always been a neighborhood like uh, that does this, and I want to continue it for my children and the next generations to come. Thank you. Nelsie Yang. Thanks everybody so much for being here. When I think about the election this year um, for all of our neighbors, I often think about accountability and who, um, you know, who we want our council member to feel accountable to. And I wanted to share that for me, it's always been working families. It's always been our unions. It's always been making sure that people are able to live and do well. It's why like I worked on the $15 minimum wage. I really believe that people, to all, everyone, Everyone deserves to be able to make a livable wage so they can care for themselves and their family. When we allow people to do that and support them in doing that, we make sure that they, you know, th that's how they can also, like, um, show up in their fullest self in the community, give back as well, and, like, raise a family or, like, you know, be a part of the community in, in a way that they're really proud of. Um, and I wanted to share that for me, you know, it, accountability has always been to people as well. Um, and I named this because um, when it comes to us being at a negotiation table, we know that there's a pie and that the pie is going to be chipped and we want the person representing us to actually be here fighting for 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 our entire community fighting to make sure that everyone's voices is at the table and that's what I do in my everyday work as a union steward as an organizer and actually you know even talking to people who are not p politically involved people who have been marginalized for a very long time and you know that's what I plan to do as a council member I'm so determined to do that it's also the reason why like our unions like our St. Paul teachers asked me SCIU so many state uh unions have come together to support me as a council member and we've actually been working as a collective for over a year now to fight and make sure that the east side gets its fair share um, and that, that people power is like something that you know that something that's so needed in a community like the east side here i'm super determined you know to also bring all of you you know along with our uh, organizations neighborhood councils so many more to the table and actually make sure that we are key decision makers in the future of the east side here and sure hope that i can count on your support this year as your first choice for a city council and i'd love to talk some more thanks everybody greg copeland Yeah, I would ask for your vote. I, I think that's uh, the first thing we got to do is get uh, get you to support us and, and get on board over at the city council to make some serious changes. And I'm going to give you three examples of why I think uh, I can do a better job. Because I'm not going to promise you everything. You can't. There's just not the money, folks. Do you want your streets fixed or do you want 15, almost $16 million spent on new bike paths? That's a real choice. And in the current budget that's before the city council, they said, yeah, spend $15.73 million on bike paths. I say, you know what? We've got a crisis on our streets. It's time to double up and spend the money where the crisis is. And, you know, if you do things right, uh, we'll take care of that. And I sat on the CIB for uh, six years under Norm Coleman. We replaced the Arcade Bridge, the uh, Earl Street Bridge. We, we did a few things. You know, so this experience thing, I wanted you to know that there's uh, more than one or two people up here with some experience. And, you know, you have to set priorities. Because you can't spend the same dollar twice, believe it or not. 
The other thing is the city collects millions of dollars from us in franchise fees. And yet we, and these are on our gas and electric bills, and yet we say we want to help the poor. Well, okay, I want to help poor people too. And I don't think we should be collecting franchise fees on the poorest citizens in the city. I think we ought to set up a system that exempts poor people who meet the same test that they have for the Federal Energy uh, Assistance Program from paying those fees. And that's in the control of the city council because it's the city council that has the franchise agreement with Excel. The other thing is we collect $18 a year from everybody that has a water meter. And we call it right-of-way maintenance. Well, I, we've got 28,000 lead service lines in St. Paul. And we need to replace those. And I want to spend that money on that. So those are three reasons I'd like to be your next city council member. Thank you. That concludes the candidate forum tonight. I want to thank the candidates for giving well-considered answers to all of the questions. And thank you, the audience, for asking great questions and for being here tonight. Please vote on November 5th. Thank you.